got it and share my screen. There we go. So if you if you go to side by side, um, you'll see the uh, people's faces on one side and the shared screen on the other. And there's a little line in between and you can shift that line, just put your mouse on it and move it. So if you wanna see more faces, you can do that. Or if you wanna see more screen, um, you can do that as well. And I'm working on two monitors. So if I look to the side, it's not that I'm looking at my phone or something, it's uh, that I'm looking at my other monitor. So um, let me just move that over, there we go. So uh, this is our second week um, of our journey through the Tanakh, and uh, it's a, just a journey. Like we can't possibly cover it all, but we're we know sort of tiptoeing through the tulips, as we say. And um, just to remind you, uh, last week we had an introduction, and um, this is where today we're going to be talking about the Torah, uh, and we'll go on to the books of the prophets. The if you remember the third part of the Tanakh, the Bible, is the books of writings. We don't get that to that until May. So we're going to be looking at this, things I thought would be interesting, might be some things you don't know, um, and might give you a general sense of what is in the Bible, because very few of us um, read it daily. I do know that I have many Christian friends that read a portion of the Bible, you know, every weekend, and um, we, we read Torah, but you know, it's in Hebrew, and we're not always reading the translation, and we don't always get to the rest of the Bible. So Let's begin. Tonight is just to review. The Tanakh is an acronym. We're going to see another acronym tonight as well um, from the words Torah, Nevi'im, which means prophets, and Ketuvim, which means the writings. Those are the three sections of the Tanakh or the Bible. We would call the Bible in English. Um, general Americans would call it the Hebrew Bible or the Jewish Bible. And um, we're going to be looking at Torah tonight. Now, there are five books of the Torah, and um, they're named, and I think we referenced this a little bit last week, they're named differently in English uh, versus the Hebrew. So Genesis, for example, somebody chime in. What's, what's the root of Genesis? What, what, why, is that, why is the first book of the Torah called Genesis? The beginning. Exactly, right? Think genetics, think that, that root word, it's the beginning, the Genesis. And in fact, in the Hebrew, it's also called Bereshit, which means tricky in a beginning. And it's a word that has baffled uh, the rabbis and the sages for millennia, because grammatically, it should say Bereshit, with an A ah under it. And, um, and yet the tradition is that it's Bereshit, and so that leaves the rabbi questioning if it's not the beginning, it's a beginning. Well, were there other beginnings? And this is where we rely on midrash, on commentary, on the oral tradition to fill in some of the gaps. But there's no definitive answer. Um, but the reason why it's called breshit is not because it means in the beginning. It's because it's the first operative word of the book of the Torah. In fact, it is the big first word of the Torah. Bereshit, bara lo arts. In, in a beginning, God began to create the heavens and the earth. So in the next book, Exodus, which is the book that we're um, in now, starts with sort of the birth of, well, the Jews getting to Egypt and the birth of Moses and ends with the Jews, um, as I think this weekend, with the Jews um, uh, getting to Mount Sinai and the golden calf. Why called Exodus? Clearly. Leaving. They leave. <laughs> exactly. It's an exit. Exactly. It's an exit. But Shemot does not mean exodus. Shemot means names. And anyone want to guess? Well, again, it's the first word of, of, the, of, the, of the book. What names are we talking about? Anyone know the beginning of Exodus? Mm -hmm. Moses? These are the names of the people that went down to Egypt. We left off in the book of Breshit that, uh, you know, Joseph was sold into slavery. He's in Egypt and his brothers come because of famine and they don't know who he is and this whole story. And finally, it's agreed that they all love each other now. And um, there's still famine in the land of Canaan. And Joseph says to his brothers, go back and get my father and come and live in Egypt. And they're given land in Egypt. And so it starts off the book with um, like a, a genealogy. These are the names. Leviticus uh, is uh, taken from a Latin root and it's the, uh, the laws of the Levites. The Levites are the priests. Um, you know, it's a, uh, the, we don't have, we, we still have a priestly class within Judaism. It's just that they have no role. So if a person is a Levite today, they know, right? You and I may not know, but they know. They know because their father told them. 
Uh, the, that status is passed from father to son, as opposed to in traditional Judaism, where status of being a Jew is passed from mother to child. Um, the tribe that you were in went from father to child. And, um, and look, is, I'm sure there's some people out there that are genetically Levites and have lost that information or that knowledge. But pretty much if someone says I'm a Levite, because my father was a Levite, I, I know this. It's true. Uh, interestingly enough, the Levites were from the tribe of Levi, one of the 12 tribes, and uh, the Kohanes, the high priests, were from, were descendants of Aaron. Aaron and Moses, brothers and Miriam, uh, were all from the tribe of Levi, and Aaron was made high priest, and that is a hereditary position. It, it went from Aaron to his sons to their offspring, etc. And there is all kinds, if you're interested in genetic research and genetic, re uh, you know, your genealogy and whatnot, there is apparently, uh, they've argued back and forth, but it seems like most people feel there is a genetic marker for, for Kohen. So if your last name is Cohen or Khan, and you know that you, you know, you were told you were Kohen, um, if you get genetic testing done, it's possible that you'll find that indeed, you are connected to other Kohanim around the world. Um, and, uh, but the Hebrew is Vayikra, which just means, and he called, meaning and God called or any said. So this word is very common in the Torah. Again, it's just the first operative word. The Midbar, numbers. Now this, now we, we're past all the laws. We're in the fourth book of the Torah. Anyone know why would this be called numbers? Counting people? They were counting. Exactly. There, it starts off with a census, and uh, it's it's unclear. Was the census for military purposes? Was it for tax purposes? What exactly was the census? All kinds of great um, stories that rabbis tell and and drush that they give explanations that they give. But that's where the where the where the name comes from. And in Hebrew, actually, it's a little bit better. It's a little bit more of a descriptive because it's bemidbar in the wilderness. We, we often used to say in the desert, but it seems to me that the modern translators are preferring to say in the wilderness. Regardless, um, that is where they are during the whole of that book. So that's a little bit more descriptive. And then Deuteronomy is uh, from the Latin or Greek, and it simply just means second telling. Um, <laughs> and it is actually in many ways a summary of all that's come before. Um, I just read a fascinating article. I don't know if you, uh, any of you see the New York Times, but there was a great article in the New York Times about um, a, a document that was found in the late 1800s, a, a you know, parchment scroll that uh, was deemed to be a fraud. And it was a big scandal, that, like 1850s, I think. And there's a scholar today, uh, uh, a young man who is basically has has done the research and he thinks it was an original, but that document was lost. Like after it became a fraud in the 1850s, the, the document's been lost. We don't know where it is, but through whatever research he's done, he's saying, no, no, this is the oldest example of the Bible that we have, this this uh, parchment. So uh, it's, anyway, it's a very interesting. Article. It was a couple of days ago in the Times, uh, but Devarim is a, is a questionable book because uh, there's a lot of questions about when it was written. There's a great place we'll see later in the Torah where one of the kings of Israel says, announces that he found the law. Well, what does that mean? What did he find? Where did it go? Did they not have the Torah? What does it mean to us? And many scholars believe that uh, he found, and I put it like this, um, he found Deuteronomy, and I put it like this because many scholars believe that it was written much later and it was written to justify uh, the current state of politics. So a lot of interesting intrigue in the Torah. Now we have other names for the Torah as well. Uh, the word Torah itself simply means instruction, teaching, theory, doctrine. It's just a, it's a word. It's, comes, it's related to the word Morah, which is teacher. Uh, but it's also known as things like the five books of Moses, even though Moses does not appear at all in Breshit. So one could argue it's really only four books of Moses. Um, and it's known as the Chumash and the Pentateuch. Now the Chumash, when I first read, I mean, I know what the word means, but when I went to look it up to find some information for you, this is what popped up first. Apparently, if you smell it with a C-H-U-M-A-S-H, -H, you will come upon this Native American tribe in the Southern and Central coastal areas of California. And they have a casino 
that we can all go and pretend we're studying Torah. But it's, <laughs> I, I assume they say chumash. I, I don't know how they pronounce it. Um, you know, it's sort of like when, uh, when chai tea became popular. And I didn't understand, like I'd walk in and why are they all eating chai tea? I, you know, I, I didn't understand really the, the word um, because when I see a CH, it's a guttural H sound. Um, but Chumash is actually a book. And it generally has the whole of the Torah, not the rest of the Bible, but it, it also usually has the accompanying uh, portion from the books of the prophets that we call the Haftarah. And we'll get into that later in, in the cycle of classes. But so the Chumash is a tool um, for synagogue use. Uh, some of the, I think, I think you use this one up in Israel. I'm, I was pretty sure, right? Eight time. And then if you grew up Jewish, many of you remember this one with the blue cover, uh, the, the Hertz Chumash. He was a chief rabbi of England and he edited uh, a Chumash that that's the one I grew up with. There's also this one and the name keeps changing. I would have called it Art Scroll, but I think it's now called either the Stone or the Koran. Uh, different uh, within the Orthodox world, different people keep funding things and the names seem to change. Um, but what we have over here is a, a page typical page from a Chumash, it happens to be from the Eitz Chaim, but it confuses people because they don't know how to read it. You've got, I know it's very small, but you've got Hebrew on one side, English on one side, and then other English. And the English will have verse numbers, but so will the, this English. <laughs> so often when I deal with people who are first learning to navigate through the physical book, they get confused. What are they reading? Well, as a rule, the side-by-side -side English Hebrew, that's the direct translation. And anything below that will be commentary. And so this might have, you know, on this page, maybe verses 10 through 15, but down here, it might only reference verse 12 and verse 14, because that's the only thing this editor included as a comment. Okay, so it's, it's, it, that's why we talk about these books being edited. Someone has made a decision what to share with you. There is much more out there. Okay, now it's also called the Pentateuch, which is one of my favorite words. That's what the Hertz uh, Humash was always called. And Penta, of course, from is the number five, right? Penta, Pentagon. And Tuch is a word for a book. And the, the important thing is that it's not a scroll, right? These are books. The only thing that is the scroll, we call it the Sefer Torah, which literally means sort of the book of Torah. But we call it, the Sefer Torah is the scroll. If you're talking about a Humash or the five books of Moses or Pentateuch, you're talking about a book. The plural, which you may hear if you're around synagogue life, is Sifrei Torah. Um, most, but not all, synagogues have more than one Torah. Mm -hmm. There are times when you need to use more than one Torah. And... Um, you can sit there while they while they roll it in front of you to get to the next part, but most synagogues uh, will make every effort to have at least two, so they can have one roll to one place and one roll to another. Um, and then uh, and then just these little terms down here, I want to just make you aware of when we talk about the Torah, it's not just the scroll and it's not just the five books of Moses; it's a whole world of knowledge. So we have something called the Torah Shabbat Shabbat, the written Torah, and that's the scroll. But the Torah Shabbat Peh is the, the Torah that is on our lips. It's an oral tradition. And what we're told, uh, our tradition tells us that at the top of Mount Sinai, Moses uh, got all the knowledge that we would ever need from God, and that it's constantly being revealed to us throughout time, through our scholars, through our, our rabbis and our sages. Um, you know, whether or not you buy that, that's another issue. But uh, the, this oral Torah, this oral tradition was never supposed to be written down, was never supposed to be fixed. And around the year 200 CE, a guy named Judah Hanasi, who was uh, head of the, uh, the sort of the Jewish government, the academy, um, he felt people were forgetting. It was going to be lost. And he made a very drastic move and he wrote down what he felt were the essential things you had to know, and, and that became the Mishnah. And almost immediately, um, people started commenting on the Mishnah. So uh, it, it remind, I always like to think of if you've ever uh, missed a class and you take notes uh, for some, oh no, someone else, your friend misses class and they say, can you take notes for me? So you take notes really nicely and you give them a copy of your notes. They don't really understand your notes. 
You didn't take it in the way they would take it. You didn't highlight the ideas they might highlight. They might come back to you with questions, right? So, so that's what happened with the rabbis is they poured through the mission and said, wait, what did he mean by this? And what does this mean? And I don't understand this point. And that becomes what's called the Gemara. And together, the mission and the Gemara are what we call Talmud. But it doesn't end there. The Talmud was codified or fixed around the sixth century CE. But from that time until today, we are still continuing to comment, right? This is a living tradition. This is a growing living tradition. It, the only thing that's fixed are the letters on the scroll, but the knowledge continues to grow. Okay, just to take a physical look at it, this is, although it's a, a sort of an old style cover in my opinion, this is an example of a, of a traditional Ashkenazic um, Torah with traditional motifs, the Lions of Judah and the Ten Commandments and the crown on top and, um, and fringe and the colors very often, certainly when I was growing up, uh, Torah scrolls, uh, they used what we might call regal colors. Um, uh, burgundies and, and purples and, and blues and golds. Um, but there's another style, and that's the Sephardic style that you can see on both sides. The Jews that the Jewish tradition that um, evolved in Spain um, uh, from about the year um, uh, 1000 until 1492 when they were kicked out, the, the, the 500 golden years of Spain, and by the way, there were not 500 golden years, there were very few golden years in there. But they developed a different tradition and Correct. their Torah, even though it's on two poles, just like ours, you can see the two poles here, but they wrapped it up together and they put it in a hard case, a hard <laughs> shell. This one is wood, this one is metal. And when they read it, rather than lying down the scroll, the scroll is standing up, this box is standing up and you stand in front of it and you read it. Now, just to show you these other pictures, not everyone in their lifetime gets to see a Torah unfurled, unrolled completely. Um, this, unfortunately, was a sad occasion after Hurricane Sandy, um, somewhere in the, in the coast of New Jersey, um, uh, the Torah scrolls were soaked and they did everything they could to try and save them. And so they literally unrolled the parchments and had them you know, lying across uh, the, the pews. Uh, but this picture over on the right is something that's, uh, it started being popular maybe 30, 40 years ago and has become more and more popular, although still a lot of rabbis are hesitant to do it, is that you literally unroll the Torah and often around a group of children. It's often done on Simchat Torah when we celebrate ending, beginning and ending the Torah. There are other times when we do it as well. And I know it, at Beth Meyer, the few times we've done it, um, everyone has to wear um, gloves. We, we have those like uh, the, the, you know, the gloves, the kitchen kind of gloves that you, uh, the, the rubber gloves. And it's held very gingerly. And you certainly want lots of people. You don't want the, the parchment sagging. The parchment is a very delicate thing. And the Torah can be different lengths, depending on how big the script is that, the, that, the, that was, it was written with. So let's learn a little bit more about the Torah. And um, the person that writes a Torah is a sofer. Um, and you might remember that we, we called it a sefer Torah. The, the word means book in Hebrew. And a sofer is a scribe. And they're called a sofer stam. Here's our next acronym. Remember I told you, if you see this little chick chop, little uh, quote marks, it means it's an acronym. And it stands for the Sifre Torah. A scribe writes a Torah scroll. A scribe writes tefillin. And a scribe writes a mezuzah, the, the, you know, the parchment that goes in our mezuzah on the doorpost. So they took these letters and it came up with stam. So if it's a sofer stam, it's a sort of a qualified certified sofer. They also, by the way, write um, ketubot, marriage contracts, and gittin, divorce contracts. Uh, you need a, a scribe to write both of those. <laughs> It can take anywhere from a year to three years, depending on the skill of the scribe and, and, and also what they've promised, because it, typically a scribe doesn't, it's not a, it is a full-time job, but they're not only writing a Torah scroll. At the same time, they might be writing Mezuzah scrolls or, or wedding uh, contracts, et cetera. Um, and so the cost, because it is a full-time basically job, can be anywhere from 25K to 60K and beyond. Um, it, it, these are not simple endeavors uh, to, to go. Now I've got a video here. Oh, you know what? I did not share with sound. I made a note to share with sound and I did not. Let me stop sharing and reshare with sound so that um, I can make sure that you can hear this. There we go. Share. Did that work? That does not look like it worked to me. 
Let me stop sharing again. Share screen with sound and I want my slideshow. Okay, share. All right, are you seeing that? Yes. Yes, okay, good. All right, so hopefully you'll be able to hear the movie. understand a little bit about it. Torahs are complicated things. It is an art form to create a Torah. Uh, it's made of, of different um, pieces that are sewn together with sinew. Um, and Torahs take maintenance. And many of our synagogues don't maintain their Torahs well. The scribe actually that you saw in the pictures is, is a guy, uh, Portnoy, Rabbi Portnoy from Florida. And he, he or his son come up um, 
I don't think at least once a year, I think to Beth Meyer, we didn't always take care of our squirrels like that, but we've now gotten on a cycle of doing that. Okay, any, any questions by the way about the Taurus squirrel before I move on? Are women permitted to ride a Taurus skull? Good question. So no, let me, let me uh, stop sharing so I can <laughs> see everybody. Um, so very good question. So it depends on who you ask. There are women scribes today. They take it very seriously. They have learned all those laws. They know, you know what their techniques, but not every synagogue would purchase a, a Torah from a woman. Um, and if you look online, there, there was a consortium of women scribes that created the first scroll by all women. It was a big deal a few years back. Um, it's, it's, it, you really, you, it's both, a, you have to be a calligraphy artist, but also so technically uh, motivated. The ink that they make, you notice they made it in a relatively small <laughs> beaker. They make the ink every day. They say every letter. Before you write the letter, you say the letter. There is a, um, I don't know, not a mitzvah. Well, I guess maybe a mitzvah, a commandment, an injunction that every Jew should write a Torah. Well, you and I are not going to write a Torah. We're not trained. But you may know of synagogues where they do that. If they're buying a new Torah, that everyone in the community, usually it's a fundraiser, you pay a few dollars here or there, and you get to complete a letter in the Torah. And the scribe will sometimes write, just outline the letter and you get to fill it in. Or sometimes I saw some pictures online where everyone touches the scribe. The scribe is writing and, and everyone sort of, it goes, it's like a, I don't know, it's like a, a, a some kind of a spiritual circle. Everyone touches someone who's touching the scribe. And in that way, you're writing your own Torah. Um, uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's fascinating. It's a fascinating area. It's, I, I'm um, vegetarian and I never really thought about um, the, how animalistic the Torah is. And there was a woman at one conference I went to, a woman scribe who was giving um, a lecture on how to prepare the parchments and I, I couldn't go. And I know others that went and had to walk out. Like it's, it's, it's very basic. It's, it's very basic. I did have one bat mitzvah student who had a lot of special needs. And when we got to, I may have told you this last week, we, we got to uh, practice in front of the scroll and she instantly jumped back and said, I can't do this. It smells like a petting zoo. And I had never noticed that the Torah smells like an animal. But apparently, if you're sensitive to that, it certainly does. Okay, back to the screen. Uh, okay, so we have the Torah and we have a cycle of reading it, which you all know. You go to synagogue, you hear the Torah. But where does it come from? Well, does someone want to read in the italics here where it says uh, Deuteronomy 31? Do I have a volunteer English reader? Oh, Diane, go ahead. And Moses instructed them as follows. Every seventh year, the year set for remission at the Feast of Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord our God in the place that he will choose, you shall read this teaching aloud in the presence of all Israel. Okay, so we don't really know what teaching they're talking about. And it's how many times a year? Three, right? Well, what does it say? Seven. Seventh year. Seventh year. Seven. Well, every so it's not seven. even every year. And the Feast of Booths is Sukkot. So yeah. that's, that's the big holiday, the big gathering, but not every year even, just every seventh year. And that's what it says. Now in the Mishnah that I talked about earlier, written around 200, there's a reference that supports this. So we sort of deduce that, okay, they were reading the Torah in public. And it seems by the time of the Mishnah that they were reading it, there were special readings for festivals, not just Sukkot and special Shabbos, special Shabbats um, and maybe fast days. It's not until the Talmudic era when it's, when it's um, solid, um, when it's fixed around the sixth century that we see that the Jews in the land of Israel called Palestine then, they begin to read the entire Torah in public and they start at the beginning and they go to the end and it takes three years, okay? And that's a schedule they know and that we, we have that documented, it's called the Palestinian cycle. But in Babylonia, because, the, and actually there's a larger Jewish community in the, well, Mesopotamia, Babylon, it's not Babylonia anymore. We still write, we still call it that, but it, 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 it long since dropped that, uh, that name. But, in, in what today would be like Iran and Iraq, um, they had a very, and it was a much larger Jewish community. They had a very different custom um, because they wanted to finish the whole scroll in one year. 
And um, what they would do is they, they divided it up into portions and they would read it in one year. And around the beginning of the 19th century, uh, I don't know, maybe more modern Jews were complaining at how long it took to read Torah on Shabbos morning. And they said, you know what, let's go to the Palestinian cycle. We'll just read a third each week. You know, first we read the first third of Breshit, and then the second third of Breshit, and then the third third. And then the next week we'll go on to the portion of Noah, the first third, the second third, the third third. And in three years time we'll finish. Well, it was attempted and um, discarded. Um, and even in the middle of the 20th century, it was attempted again. Um, you know, you wound up reading portions at a different time from the synagogue down the block. It, it got very confusing and it didn't take. But in the late 1900s, uh, the Committee on Law, Jewish Law and Standards of the Rabbinical Assembly, which is the conservative movement, passed a response, meaning that they, uh, they, they passed a law basically, allowing for the triennial cycle that we know today. Now the triennial cycle we know today is not what they did in Palestine. Right, in the Palestine, it took them three weeks to finish the first portion of Brace Sheet, and then they went out to Noah. What we do today is on the first week of the cycle, we read a third of Brace Sheet. The second week, we read a third of Noah, and so on. And, and, and in that way, over a period of three years, because the second year you read the second third of each portion, and the third year you read the third portion. So over a period of three years, you have heard all of the words. But in the period of one year, you've gone from the beginning to the end. Now, here's where it gets really tricky. So the Torah is divided up into 54 sections. And we call each section either a parasha or a parsha. The plural is parshiot. It can also be called a sedra. A sedra related to the word seder, like for Passover, meaning order. So it's the order of things. Parsha just means a division. And then each of these 54 sections is divided into what we call aliyot. And you may have heard the term that you're called to Torah, you call for an aliyah to the Torah. Um, uh, aliyah means to go up. And, and when you're called to the Torah, it's seen as a, as a going up, whether, it, whether it's to replicate climbing Mount Sinai or, or a going up in, in sort of stature because you're closer to the Torah. You know, some of you may know the term, of course, we use it if one moves to Israel. It's called making Aliyah because that is seen as a higher status. And by the way, for Israelis that move here from Israel, it's called Yerida. It means they're going down. So it's not such a nice, not such a nice <laughs> term. Um, but so it's divided into Aliyot. And you can see from this chart, there's a whole system here. Shabbat, which is what we're most familiar with, the, the Parsha is divided into seven, seven Aliyot. What's, what's the connection of seven on a Shabbat Torah reading? Seven days of the week. Of the week. Seven days of the week, seven days of creation, exactly. But we also read Torah starting Shabbat afternoon and then Mondays and Thursdays. We read uh, a portion from the next week's portion. And there's only three aliyot, also on certain holidays. On Rosh Chodesh, which is the beginning of the month, um, we read uh, four aliyot. Chol HaMoed is a, a great term that not many American Jews know. It's, it's the intermediate days, it's holiday but it's not yuntif. It's not uh, a day where you would stop working. So Passover, right, for us, which is coming up, eight days long, the first two days and the last two days are yuntif. The no. in-between days, the four in-between are called chol hamoed. They are the, the, the weekdays of the festival. And on holidays themselves, on the yuntif, we have five uh, readings and Yom Kippur morning, just to be different, there's six. I don't know who came up with this. I couldn't find that in my research, but this is what everyone does. I take that back. This is what conservative and Orthodox Jews do. The reform movement uh, takes a lot more license with some of this than, than we do. Um, but still in all, it's, it's, we're all on the same portion, almost. So 54 Parshio, what's the problem? This one, two weeks. <laughs> what do you do with the other two? How does that fit? And we're on a lunar calendar which actually there are only 50 or 51 weeks in the lunar calendar. Although on a leap year, which occurs seven times in a 19 year cycle, again, how they figure this out, it's amazing. Um, <laughs> you add in four weeks. We don't have a leap day on the Jewish calendar. We have a leap um, month, right? Seven times in 19 years, they add a whole month uh, right before the month of Adar, right before when Purim is, but it still doesn't always fit, okay? so. And even more so, we don't really need 50, 
four weeks, we need 53 weeks, because the very last portion we don't read on a Saturday. We read it on the holiday of Simchat Torah. So all over the place with these numbers, how does it work? Well, they have a system of double portions, so they make it fit. On the years when we don't have an, uh, enough weeks to read every portion, it's not a leap year, we lump together these portions. It gets even more complicated because if Passover, uh, not this year, Seder's on a Saturday night. So not this year, but, but oh, the end of Passover will be on a Saturday. And so we're not gonna read the regular Shabbat portion. We're gonna read a Passover portion. So it gets all crazy. And by the way, it gets even crazier because uh, Israel only has seven day long holidays. We have eight day long holidays. So it's possible sometimes that for us, the Saturday is Yantif, the last day of Passover. And in Israel, they already finished Passover on Friday. So they're reading the next weekly portion. We're reading a holiday portion. And for a bunch of time, Israel and, the, and anyone outside of Israel are reading different portions. It can be overwhelming. Um, and these are the portions that are sometimes lumped together. And, and we don't say add. Like it, this, actually, this coming weekend is Bayakel Pakude. So it's Vayakel and Pakude together, but we just simply say the words together. Very confusing, but you don't have to worry about it because you just check a calendar, right? Even the rabbis do not have to figure this out. This is not like a major, you know, uh, mathematical equation we have to deduce. There's a book called the Luach, which means it's a calendar. For, for us, you know, you can choose any, look at any Jewish calendar, but the rabbis, uh, many of them will get something called the Luach, which gives them very specific information about what to do when. They, they learned about it in rabbinical school. They do not have to memorize it all. Um, so finally, what is in the Torah? It took us a long time to get there. Where does it begin? Creation. It begins with creation. Where does it end? Genesis. Uh, ready to enter the land, right? Where, where does the Torah end? They're getting ready to enter the land. And who dies? Moses. Moses. Right. So a little bit, we call it the five books of Moses because he dies at the end. Right? He doesn't continue. All right. Now, um, this is a very nice, I, I created the visual, but the information I didn't create is from myjewishlearning.com. But to look at each of the books, and actually now that I'm looking at it, it's in English. So I started from the left, but usually Jewish things like to start from the right. It's very confusing when you have two different languages. But we know in, the, in, in a beginning, we start with creation and we, we conclude where they get to Egypt. They're in Egypt, the whole Exodus story, right? The whole thing we're gonna review at the Seder in just a couple of weeks. And it ends with this very lengthy narrative of building this tabernacle in the wilderness. This book, you notice it's, it, they put a short description. Most of us know just the first two books. All of the stories you learn in the Bible, all the stories that we have in common with our Christian friends who learn Bible stories, um, you know, the Noah and the Ark and the Tower of Babel and, and Abraham and, and all those stories are gone in a blink of an eye in our cycle. And then the whole story of the Exodus takes a while, but then this, it's like, nobody really knows what's in here unless you're really paying attention. <laughs> They're not stories. The book of Leviticus is mostly laws, although there are stories woven in between, but we have the laws of Kashru. We have laws of what, what does it mean to be pure and impure, which is not the same as dirty and clean. Um, and a highlight in the book is something called the holiness code, which is um, really all the laws that you need for a decent society. Uh, to be good to one another, to take care of one another, to take care of the orphan and the widowed and the, and the infirm and, and the stranger and, um, and uh, having equal measures that you're not supposed to cheat somebody in business. And all of these laws that would build a decent society are, are, are contained in here. We then get to the Midbar. And now we're, we're, we've got the story of the spies. Now, all of this happens. And you know, how many years are they in the desert? Boy. Boy. 40. 40. But really, they, um, <coughs> the whole book, well, of course, Brashit, sheet, they're not even in Egypt yet. And when we get to the wilderness or the, or the Bamidbar, that's the first time they send these spies, spies, uh, um, not really spies, they're like advanced <laughs> scouts. And they go to look at the land and can we enter the land? And of course, the first time they do this, which is only about two years after the Exodus itself, 
they come back and say, there's no way. Well, there's just no way we can't. Those people are giants and they're, they're, they're strong and, and we can't go in there. There's no way we could, we could do that. And it's for that that we then wander for another 38 years, 40 total in the wilderness, waiting for the next generation, <laughs> waiting to become a society. And I've been thinking a lot this year. I don't know how I'm, I'm not exactly sure what I'm doing for Seder, but I've been thinking a lot about this this year based on last summer, Black Lives Matter, all of the, the, the issues of racism that I thought <laughs> were uh, naively, I thought, well, I'm not, I'm, I, I, it has nothing to do with me, right? It, but that's not true. And one of the issues that I'm really exploring is we as Jews have been talking about the Exodus from slavery for 3,500 years. It's in our prayer service twice a day. <clears throat> we have a holiday dedicated to it. We have Torah portions dedicated to it. We constantly remember it. We took 40 years to process it. And yet we still don't let go. And the American black community did not get that. They, they didn't get that. First of all, of course, they didn't choose to be on these shores. That's a whole other issue. But, you know, we're living in the South. We know what happened, right? They were given, uh, they were set free, and which, you know, was not exactly freedom and the carpetbaggers and the whole tenant farmer thing. And they were told, get over it. Forget about it. We don't want to hear about it anymore. And they didn't have those 40 years to process it as we did. And they certainly have been shut down in all kinds of places from, from putting it in a place where they can then move forward. So I'm very intrigued with the connections, especially with Seder coming up. And then, oh, but, but mind you, throughout this whole thing, the Israelites continue to rebel, behave poorly. They're constantly challenging authority. It's never a bed of roses. And then finally, we get to this last book of the, of the Bible, which is uh, uh, Moses' final words to the people. A lot of things are repeated and reviewed with slight differences, which is always interesting. And uh, finally, he passes the reign of, of control over to Joshua, who will take over once they get into the land. Um, but what is the Torah? Is it history? Is it myth? It was not written as a history book. You know, <laughs> kids always will think they'll challenge uh, an educator and they'll say, well, I know the Torah is not true because there are no dinosaurs in the Torah. <laughs> okay, there's a whole lot of things not in the Torah, right? <laughs> when you write a diary, if you write a journal or a diary, you don't write every single thing you did every minute of the day. You write the highlights. You write what was important to you. The only place where we have a true documentation of exactly what's going on is like the congressional record where it's done like you know court reporter minutes every word is in there they're very boring to look through by the way um so the torah was never meant to be history it is our history but it was written as a history book and myth a lot of people get very upset with the word myth but the word myth is actually what i'm very comfortable with now the torah is one of an amazing array of what are called ancient Near East myths. Stories that were passed down from generation to generation. We, of course, by tradition, believe that ours comes from God. Well, so do other people believe that about their stories, right? And they are just stories and they're remarkable similarities. Okay, uh, like there's more, well, I'll get to that. Hold on a second. So what are some of the stories that you know in the Torah? Some of the ones we mentioned, give me a story. Noah in the Ark. Noah in the Ark, it's a great one. And by the way, there's other art, there are other flood stories, right? right. What's yeah. another story you know from the Torah? Uh, the burning bush. Okay, yeah. Moses and the burning bush. What's another one? Um, Parting the Red Sea. Parting the Red Sea, right? These are great stories. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of stories that most folks don't know because we don't teach them to children because they're not really meant for children necessarily. And very few of us continue studying after you're done with bar mitzvah, which is one of the shames of American Judaism. So we don't usually teach kids. I mean, actually at Beth Meyer Synagogue, we do, but that's another whole issue. But generally kids don't learn about that, that Jacob had at least one daughter. In addition to the 12 sons, he had at least one daughter. She's named, her name is Dina. And I, I actually don't think it's so clear that she was raped, but it's referred to as a rape of Dina. And it's a horrific story because she definitely has relations with a man. He, he then wants to marry her. And by the way, some would say that if you have sexual intercourse, that is marriage in those days. He comes to her brothers. He says, I want to marry her. They say, sure, you have to be one of us. You all have to be circumcised. 
So this guy, Shechem, goes back to his people and they all, these adult males, all are circumcised, however they do it, with flints or whatever. On the third day after the circumcision, when it's known that that is the worst day of pain, the brothers of Dina go and kill the entire city. They kill all of these men, including this man that wanted to marry Dina. It's a horrible story. I mean, there's all kinds of things written about it, including the Red Tent, which is sort of a modern midrash written by uh, Anita Diamond. If you haven't read it, it's a great read, but it's just hypothesis. We don't know, okay? Justice for Tamar. Tamar's a woman. She's married to the son of Judah. Judah's one of the brothers and her husband dies. Now there's a law that says, if your husband dies and you don't have a child yet, his brother takes you in as a wife because the name of your first husband should continue. It's called the Leverite marriage. Well, so she does marry the brother and he dies. So she says to her father-in-law, you gotta give me to, to the next son who's very young. And the father thinks to himself, I'm not giving her to my baby. All of the guys that she marries die. I'm not, I'm not doing this to my third. And she's aware that he's not gonna keep his word. And she uh, dresses up as a, as a prostitute. And uh, the father-in-law actually winds up sleeping with her, doesn't know that it's her. And, um, and she sort of exposes him that he, he didn't uh, fulfill his word as the Leverite marriage. Fascinating story. Zealousness of Pinchas. This is a guy that in the middle of the desert decided that somebody did something wrong and he rams this man and, and the woman that he's having relations with, he rams him through with a sword, the two of them into a, into a, like a, into a doorway. He just skewers them. I mean, what a horrible story. <laughs> There's a reason it's in there, but you have to look hard for it. And then my favorite, which I don't know why more people don't teach children this story. I teach all of my children this story, all my students, talking donkeys in the Torah. It's the greatest story ever. It's, a, it's, a, it's about a guy named Bilam, and uh, he's a, like a witch doctor kind of guy. He's going to go curse the Jewish people. And through a series of things, his donkey winds up talking to him and saying, don't do that. It's a great story. We read it like, uh, I don't know when we read it, maybe in the summertime. It's Parshat B'Shalach. And, um, but the important thing is, he doesn't curse the people. And in fact, he says words that are in our prayer book. The only words we have by a non-Jewish prophet in our prayer book, Matovu Ohalacha Yaakov, Mishkanotecha Yisrael. The words you're supposed to, that, that are traditionally said when you walk into the sanctuary, how wonderful are your dwelling places, O Israel, your, your tents, O Jacob, or your tents, O Israel, your dwelling places, O Jacob. Okay. Now let's look at some other problems. Creation, all right? You, you probably know the story of creation. Let there be light. Uh, first day, created sky. Second day, dry land, blah, blah, blah. Move some stars, life in the seas, and mammals. Now, Interestingly enough, and especially for those kids, that, that eight-year-old that challenges you that none of this is true, we have science, this order of creation actually mirrors what the scientists tell us. Life begins in the water, mammals are created last. It's almost a little creepy how thousands of years ago, how close they were to what the scientists are telling us. But now, uh, and, and look, if someone can someone read where it says verse 26 down here? Someone want to read the English? I'll read it. Sure, sure, go ahead, Michelle. And God said, let us make Adam in our image after our likeness. Okay, so first of all, who's the hour? Who's God talking to? We don't know. Keep going. They shall rule the fish of the sea. Okay, he's talking about one being called Adam or Adam. <laughs> from uh, the, the ground is called Adama. So the, he, this is something from the ground. Okay. Who's they? Keep going. Yeah, uh, the, the birds of the sky, the cattle, the whole earth, and all the creeping things that creep on earth. And God created Adam in God's image. In the image of God, God created him. Male and female, he created them. <laughs> the sixth day. What does that mean? Was it an androgynous being? What, what does that mean? And what's missing? What, what, what don't we see in this story of creation? What's missing that you all know the story of? Animals. What about Adam's rib? Great Spencer Tracy Catherine Hepburn movie. Where, right. Where's Adam's rib right. in all of this? That's right. What, what, what happened? Well, it turns out that if we keep going in chapter two, verses four through 25, there is a second creation story, guys. And that's where we see <laughs> the whole bit with Adam and Eve and Adam's rib. And by the way, the order of creation is different. Man is much more dominant in the second story. So we look to this, this, uh, 
science of, of what's called a documentary hypothesis. I referenced it last time. Um, that these stories came from different places and somebody that we refer to as the redactor, which to me is just a horrible word. I always have to look it up, but it's someone who puts things together, the redactor and writes it down. The redactor somehow put these stories together is a modern critical way of looking at it. But if you don't take that viewpoint, if, you're, if you take a viewpoint of pure faith, there are ways that you can look at these stories and it all makes sense together. It doesn't make sense to me, but it does to the, the truly faithful that God gave all these words verbatim exactly to Moses on Mount Sinai. Okay, let's keep going. Cain and Abel, great story, right? Uh, two brothers, uh, Cain gets angry at his, at his brother Abel and he kills him. Okay, so who wants to, um, to uh, read verse eight? Uh, well, you had your hand up. You wanna read verse eight here? Yes, ma'am. And Cain spoke unto Abel his brother. And it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Big question. What did Cain say to Abel? Right. It's missing. We don't know. In fact, many, uh, many translators today, Everett Fox and others, they will put dot, dot, dot here, indicating that we think we're missing some text. <laughs> right? We think something got lost here. What did he say? We don't know. Uh, Noah, is, we're told he was righteous in, in his generation. So does that mean he was a righteous man? What do you mean in his generation? Was he only righteous compared to others? We don't know. We that's, also have- That's the consensus, isn't it? That he was good among his generation. So when you say consensus, I would say amongst liberal <laughs> Jewish paths, that's a consensus. But um, there are certainly uh, avenues within Judaism that say, absolutely not. He was righteous. Now, he wasn't the first Jew. Who was the first Jew? Abraham. Abraham. Okay. And, and what do we know about Abraham? How did he become the first Jew? What do we know? God spoke to him. God did speak to him as an adult. But where, where did that come from? The truth is, what most kids will tell you is the whole story of Abraham in the idol shop, yeah, right? And the and idols and Abraham. Not in the Torah, people. That's, that's commentary. We know nothing about Abraham until he appears as an adult who already talks to God. We have no idea how that came about. Now, there's great commentary on it, great studies. I just went to a great lesson with my professor in Jerusalem that I love saying with, but nothing's definitive. Then, of course, we have the binding of Isaac, where Abraham goes to sacrifice his son, which um, I really loved a, uh, an interpretation of that, that actually Abraham failed the test, that after this episode, Abraham no longer speaks with God. You don't ever see him speaking with God in the Torah after this. And so I really was comfortable with the fact that, you know what, guys, he failed the test. He, we're not supposed to have a blind faith. But I did just go to a lesson with my professor in Jerusalem, and he might have me convinced that I can accept that, that he was tested and it, he did have faith, and that's why he was rewarded uh, with being the father of a great nation. We have trickery, right? Rebecca tricks her, or tricks her husband, and, and Jacob tricks his brother out of the birthright, right? Rebecca, you know, um, you know, goes in cahoots with Jacob to trick her husband. You know, she tells her son, put on a, a, a goat skin or a lamb skin so that your father, who can't see very well, will think it's your brother Esau. What kind of, these aren't role models, right? <laughs> um, and Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery, which by the way, comes up in the middle ages when Jews are put on trial, literally put on trial for their lives. And the, the, the church at the time accused them, you're still Jewish, your people sold your own brother into slavery. Don't you think you should be punished for that? Mm -hmm. Right, that's part of the disputations in the middle ages. And of course, coming up to Passover, all over the Torah, we have God, God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Well, I'm sorry. As a thinking person, is Pharaoh really the bad guy? If God maybe hadn't hardened his heart, would he have let them go earlier? What does this mean? And our rabbis, again, have ways of explaining it. But there are all these things in there that when you do what's called a close reading of the simple text, you kind of start saying, huh, what's going on? And of course, the golden calf instinct, who was at fault? I did a great, we're, we're going to run really close to the end of time. But we're almost done. Um, the, I, I, I had a lesson for children where I would have them role play. And uh, the deal was that uh, the teacher uh, didn't, wasn't prepared, needed copies. But it's so long ago that she had to go to the ditto machine. 
And uh, Will, you may not know what that is. That was an old thing the teachers used to use to make copies. And, um, and she left the room, but the ditto machine was out of ink. And so it took her longer, longer, longer. She's gone a long time, but before she had left, she asked the, 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 you know, her teacher's pet, the best kid, to uh, be in charge of the class, right? Keep them quiet, keep them working. Well, the kids were getting anxious and they were getting fidgety and they started, uh, you know, um, misbehaving. And this kid happened to be a really good sort of artist, cartoonist. So he started drawing pictures on the board to keep the kids interested. So the kids started egging him on. And finally they said, ooh, draw a picture of the principal, draw a picture of the principal. So he draws this caricature, not very pleasant, of the principal. And who walks in at that moment? The principal. Of course. <laughs> Whose fault is it? Is it the kids who egged him on? Is it the kid who drew the picture? Is it the principal who didn't have his, his supply room properly stocked? Is it the teacher who wasn't prepared? All right. The, the teacher is Moses who goes up on that mountain for 40 nights and doesn't come back. Right. The principal is God. Maybe God should have realized this wasn't a good way to do it. The kid leading the class is Aaron, who was maybe just doing anything he could to keep the people calm. Right. Who's at fault? We don't know. Great story. OK. Uh, and finally, we'll end with a great um, uh, uh, quote from the Talmud, from the Mishnah, the ethics of our fathers. A rabbi named Ben Bagbag, also one of the great names in the Mishnah, Ben Bagbag said, turn it over and again, turn it over for all is therein and look into it and become gray and old therein and do not move away from it for you have no better portion than it. And the it is the Torah. It's all there. Keep studying it, keep looking at it. You know, kids will say, oh, we learned this last year. And I always love to say, well, you know what, the rabbi, who knows a whole lot more than you do, also studies the Torah portion every single week, every year. We go back and we go back and we go back and we turn it and we turn it because there's there, it's all in there. It's an amazing, amazing treasure for us. Um, and and Rabbeinu Yona, a commentator from the 1200s wrote that what this means in his opinion is review the words of Torah, all the wisdom of the world is included. So I'll leave you with that. Um, and we meet again next uh, Thursday, I think it's next week, yeah, March 18th, we'll be doing the V'im, which are the books of the prophets, not the prophets, but this <laughs> section of, of the Bible called the prophets. So does anybody have any questions? I did a lot of talking tonight. Well, who did God talk to in the beginning? What is your perception? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I, I don't have, you know, I, I, some of you may have uh, spent that evening with Eliana uh, Light when she was um, at, uh, at B'nai Israel. And Eliana is a wonderful teacher about God and faith and spirituality. And because, I be, and I, some, I have to go back to her lessons again and again, because I would say to you, I don't have a really strong God concept. I, so, for personally, I sort of, I have like a basket and everything I don't understand in the world goes in the basket and that basket is sort of God territory. So I don't really know. Uh, I'm very comfortable with, with the Torah being ancient wisdom from people 3,500 years ago that I may or may not be uh, genetically related to. And, um, and that it's, it's survived to this time and it's, it's my heritage. It's it, either by choice or by birth, it's your heritage. And so it's important. Um, but, you know, that's a little, you can say that about some Star Trek episodes when they find lost civilizations and they've got these traditions and it's their heritage. Um, it's a sense of belonging. Me, I'm sorry? It's a sense of belonging to something stronger than you. Stronger and, and greater, right? Exactly. Exactly. Especially in moments uh, like the birth of a child, like Rabbi Bender's child, or when at the loss. We've had so much loss this year, both from COVID and other things. I recently just heard that they're noticing they're, that they're finding more cancer cases because they think people are um, both taking less better care of themselves, but also not going to the doctor. So they're picking up cancer at later stages, right? More, I guess more incidences of like stage four than, than they had seen before COVID. Anyway, at those times, you gotta think there's something out there that we don't understand. And I'm happy calling that God, Diane. Um, I think the thing about the Torah that amazes me is there's a great deal of wisdom there. And in my mind, wisdom never gets old. Very nice. You can take it and you can apply it in one place at one time, and then you can 
a year later, apply it somewhere else, the same thing, but somewhere else. So, and I mean, when you think about the laws that were written so long ago, and they're, they're really the basis for our laws in this country, I mean, wow. Yeah, yeah. And I like that you use the word wisdom, because there is, for me, a danger in taking a fundamentalist approach to the text. Mm -hmm. that, 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 and, and that to me is not wisdom. That's holding on to uh, you know, a word for word detail without thinking, right. right? I think the text demands that we wrestle with it, right? Yisrael means you wrestle with God. That's what the word Yisrael means. The L at the end is a, is a Hebrew word for God. And so I love that you use that word wisdom. And, and I often say to, to uh, my students, many of whom come from a variety of different backgrounds, or I'll say when I'm in interfaith settings, it's not that it is the best or the only, it's that it's, it's mine, yeah. right? <laughs> you have your relationship to God. You have your faith path to God. This is the Jewish faith path to God, right? So I, I learn from others and I appreciate this one is mine, right? And, uh, and, and I'm, I, again, I'm very comfortable with it. Uh, other people are, struggle with it. They, they, they struggle, you know, the, the Jews, the, the, the socialist Jews, the workman's circle, the Yiddishists uh, mm -hmm. that, that are still here with us and, you know, and they're cultural Jews. And, and I don't mean that in a, in, a, in a flighty way. They take it seriously. It is their culture. This is not the word of God. They don't care about God. Okay, that works too, right? There, there's a, it's, it, it, it's intertwined. You know, it, it's to me, it's personally amazing that you have yeshiva students who study it every day, seven days a week, six days a week, whatever. And it, it's a constant studying, interpretation, thoughts, ideas, challenges. Um, it, it's amazing. It, it's not a verbatim. No, and, and, it's, and it's living. It, it continues. But I'll, I'll tell you an interesting thing. That the, the, the people you're thinking of in the yeshiva studying day by day, they're not studying Torah. Torah is read in shul. And, and for that world, they read it in shul, it's fine. And they'll give a drash on it, they'll give an explanation. They're studying Talmud. It, Talmud. And so there, there's slight differences. But still in all, it is the fact that it is a living thing. And, um, and, it, and every year you find something new. Um, every year for Passover, you know, kids will say, you know, again, you know, why do you have to review it? Well, even I remember my father pretty late in life sitting down and he, used to, he was a very last minute guy. So it'd be like two nights before Seder, but he'd quickly get his book and he'd, like, he'd be yelling to, before he could find the book with his name on it, with his notes. And what did we want to include and what do we want to keep out and how are we going to make it different? My father had been leading Seder his whole life, practically. His father died when he was a fairly young man. And, you know, he'd been leading Seder probably from his late 20s. Every year you review it, right? The rabbis, every year they review it. You find something new. You find something relevant, meaningful, whatever it might be. Uh, and the Torah is the same way. And every, I'm always impressed with the people in shul who sit and, and actually read the English, because um, I don't. I mean, when I was a kid, Torah reading was a time to talk. You'll pardon me, it was. And uh, where Diane where Diane and I know each other from in Caldwell, I, when I visited my mother, I still found them talking during the Torah reading. They read the full portion. It takes a long time. And they would visit. In fact, in my, uh, this synagogue in, uh, in Jerusalem, um, a, a Turkish synagogue where my grandfather's uh, relatives from Turkey moved to Israel, and I would go to this beautiful synagogue. And I'm sitting up in the you know, balcony with the women, very few women. And the old men are downstairs. And every so often during the Torah reading, I hear this rap on the table, loud rapping on the table. What is it? The men are all talking. So I said something to my cousin, who's, who was in his, probably his early eighties by then. I said, well, you know, why are you all talking? And he said, you know, we used to live in this neighborhood. We all moved away. We're old. We only see each other on Shabbos morning. We talk. <laughs> So, you know, it, it's, it's sort of an intriguing thing, but for the people that do read the portion every week and the eighth time has got great commentary. Um, at Beth Meyer, we have a, a, a study group that meets um, every morning after Kiddush. Now they're doing it online. And we discuss the portion of the week because there's always something to discuss. No. All right, that's it for tonight, guys. Unless you have more questions. I, I was just gonna say, I think it, it, it's relative because we, our lives keep changing. So what we try to do is find out well, how, how is the Torah looking at it? 
And there's always, always seems to be something that you could make a relation. Totally. And Torah for a five-year-old is different than Torah for a teenager is different than Torah for uh, a 20 something single and figuring life out and different for new parents. And, and, and then as we age, it continually grows with us. Yeah. If you, but establish a relationship with it. Thank you. And it's there for you. It's yours. Okay. I will see some of you. I hope next week. Thank you, Amy. And Thank you. everybody will be back here again, same time next Thursday. And then the yep. following Thursday, we have a special uh, visitor. Um, the rabbi's sister is going to take us to Egypt. So right. make sure you put the next two Thursday nights on your calendar, seven to eight. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you then. I Thank hope we you. haven't scared Will away. I hope he comes back. Now he, he, I um, think he just turned his camera off. I'm very much going to be here again. I'm sorry, <laughs> Great, my well, camera. My welcome, camera. Welcome, and we'll look forward to having you on again next week. Great. Thanks, Bye, all. Take care. Bye-bye.